Wonderful, yes. And as Zohar said, the idea is to challenge each other. We don't want to have agreeable panels where we want to bring different perspectives to the table and understand how can we make this work. For the last 70 years, we've had one way of governing things through the SEC and through certain government bodies. And now we have new ways. And it's like trying to fit a round peg into a square hole. We must have these conversations converge and push each other to get in the uncomfortable positions to have those conversations. So let's challenge each other today. And let's bring that real talk to the table like Zohair was telling you. And we're so excited to have those conversations. And I'd like to segue into getting into the introduction of the first panel of the day to set the tone for what is establishing trust in Web3 after we're left, after the music has stopped. Who's here? Who's been fostering that trust? Who's been the leaders of this revolution? And, and how have they done that? We need to learn from the best and the most brilliant minds in this industry. So a little bit more background on Zohair. Uh, he was nominated twice as German Entrepreneur of the Year with a grand vision that has now come to life at this conference and he's also founded a nonprofit company, X School of the Future, with a mission to revolutionize the education system and empower the next generation by opening a hundred schools throughout Europe. And that is absolutely incredible. Education is one of the most important parts of spreading this narrative. And as we segue into the fireside chats with Yatsu, none other than Yatsu, the prolific entrepreneur, investor, and industry leader, world leader in entertainment, gamification, and blockchain innovation, you know, Yat is, is just such an industry. He's, he's a trailblazer. And I actually had the pleasure of doing a podcast with him not too long ago, and his words touched me so much. When Zohair told me that he was going to be the one to set the tone here in this first fireside chat, I, I couldn't believe it. It was just like, this is exactly where we need to be at the right time in this important crossroads. And Yat Su, as many of you already know, is the co-founder and chairman of Animoca Brands, the powerhouse Animoca Brands, that has been able to foster that trust and to keep that trust during these times, these tumultuous times throughout that his represent his represent his his whole aura and everything that he's been able to build with Animoca speaks for itself. And we're going to go deep into the depths of how he was able to establish that in this fireside chat on trust, leadership, and education. I'd like to welcome Yatsu to the stage. Please, big round of applause. Welcome, nice having you here. Okay, you guys cannot believe how much I'm looking forward to this. It's way too short. I wanted like five hours only with him. Um, I had the privilege to talk yesterday with him, so I'm very much looking forward. Yeah, um, in my touch points with Animoca, and for example with Mo, who I believe is one of the world's experts in tokenomics, but not only that, he's always very kind, very helpful, very supportive. Or with Robbie, who was one of the first guys to confirm that he would be speaking. Again, very supportive. I had the feeling that at Animoca, people like each other, people trust each other, and trust is a part of your guys' DNA. And first of all, congratulations to that. It's not easy to have such a company with such a spirit. Mm. However, in the backdrop of the last 12 to 24 months, the subject of trust and trusting a company cannot be said about all the companies in our industry. So what do you think are the learnings that you have drawn or the learnings that the industry leaders <coughs> need to draw to move forward in a more meaningful way? Thank you. And that's, that's a pretty heavy start for the day, but I uh, appreciate that. So first of all, yes, I do count ourselves very blessed. We have a great team. Uh, that really sort of believes in this vision. So I'll start with that because I think that's what the industry generally needs to think about is when you think about building any business, it doesn't have to be related to Web3, it's why you're building it. What's the mission? What's the purpose? We believe in the future of Web3 that it creates more equity, that we have more stakeholders for all, uh, meaning that we think we can also solve capitalism, the problems of capitalism, because everyone can own a stake in the network that they have. And so the effect would be that we share in the network effect that we co-create. Now, if you believe in that vision, that's a really big vision. It's still playing itself out. And the people that join you, if they believe in that vision, then they're actually joining a purpose that is bigger than their own, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, a, it's not just a vision. It's what you want to see happen. Even if we fail, 
we can say we have tried our best to make a change in the world, to make an impact that has a purpose. And I think one of the challenges that a lot of times happens, and again, I wouldn't say this is only in Web3 and crypto, this happens in the finance industry, other industries, energy industry, is that you have a number of actors that see an opportunity and then take advantage of it. They take advantage of it, but they have only one purpose themselves, which is to make money for themselves. And that basically creates some of the problems that we've had in the past. Um, and particularly because of the way capital forms in Web3, it has brought forward, frankly, some of the ugly things about capitalism, which we have seen before. Stock markets, Lehman crisis, even you know, um, you know, back, you know, back in the early days when the stock market came out in Amsterdam or you know, a British East India Company, hundreds and hundreds of years of examples of capitalism can be a force, is a force of good. It drives innovation and entrepreneurship. But the flip side of capitalism can also be ugly because people take advantage and so on. And so I think that's really what we as an industry need to do is we need to appreciate why we're here, that we're building for impact and purpose. And if you can see the long term for it, then you'll build towards it. You won't think about you know, making a quick buck. I mean, for, 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 our, for instance, um, at the peak of our industry in 2021, you know, our token positions were worth $16 billion. It's a lot of money. We didn't sell any. Maybe that was stupid, <laughs> but why didn't we sell? We didn't, we didn't sell because we believed in the future of the governance of these tokens. In other words, if you want to have a say about how the industry can work better, then we need to hold on to these votes. We can't just sell it, right? But if you're thinking just about making money, then obviously the logical thing is to sell. So again, it draws down to the question as to why you're here and what, what your purpose is. Great. And what does this mean specifically for your future investment decisions? Well, I mean, for us, we're thinking, to me, I look at Web3 a little bit like going back to the future, as it were. Because for those of you who know a little bit about my background, you know, um, I was there for Web1. I saw the problems in Web2. And Web1 was all about decentralizing and democratizing access to information. Open source, you know, all these things that we sort of believed so strongly in. And to me, Web3 is that same promise, except supercharged, because now we have also financial knowledge, financial literacy, and value attached to it as well. So that means that in, um, you know, for me, it was like, if I had a chance to, you know, knowing what I know today, how, how would I think about growing and investing the Web1 world in Web3? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're doing, right? In other words, it wasn't just about picking the next Amazon or so on. It was about basically investing in an open ecosystem that would promote an open and shared network. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did in Web3. We have over 450 investments today. Mm -hmm. And we don't think of each investment necessarily as having the best returns. We think of the investment creating economic activity mm -hmm. in the entire ecosystem that Web3 is building. That means we don't invest in one marketplace. We invest in a dozen marketplaces. Mm -hmm. We don't invest in one guild. We invest in a dozen guilds because we want them to activate the economies and even if those guilds don't give us the, or these investments don't give us the best return individually, the network effect that they generate for the entire ecosystem mm -hmm. will benefit as a, us as a whole. So it's almost like, how does a nation invest in its country? Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't think of the return in the individual company, it thinks of the ecosystem as a whole. So that's basically been our approach. Okay. So talking about nation, has your viewpoint on investing in a certain type of founder changed given the last 12, 24 months? So for us, it hasn't changed how we look at founders, but I would say it's been easier to find in a bear market than in a bull market, right? Because in a bull market, everyone will say the right thing, but, uh, and money comes easily. But in a bear market, it's not just about saying the right thing, it's about doing it, and it's about persevering. One of the challenges in a bear market is you have to keep building, and if you can't actually raise the money, then you have to make sacrifices, right? You have to cut costs, you have to change your lifestyle, you have to do things. And this is the big quest, this becomes a big question. Is the purpose that you're building for bigger than you? Mm -hmm. If it's bigger than you, the sacrifice is okay. You can maybe move to a small apartment or you can maybe see your friends less or maybe you're willing to move to a new country because the purpose is that important. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's too much for you. Then maybe that wasn't for you. Mm -hmm. And that's not wrong. People sometimes meander around the world and discover their life purpose and it may take many tries until they find it. And it's these times where you can find those. Mm -hmm. Our biggest early successes came when we made all of these investments in 2018. OpenSea, Axie Infinity, 
required the Sandbox, Dapper Labs, you know, Wax, Decentraland. 2018 was much worse than today. Bitcoin was like $3,000. Ethereum actually at one point was, I think, $80, right? I mean, that was a really bad market. But there were people building for NFTs, building marketplaces, believing in the future of Web3 gaming in 2018, 2019. Those are the jewels. Because, you know, and maybe this is one of the challenges. Maybe we're too early, right? This was, you know, people didn't say it wouldn't happen. People just said, are you 10 years too early? And timing is very hard to capture. But if you have conviction, then timing almost doesn't matter, I would feel, because even if it would take five years longer, we would still be right, we think. So talking about timing and conviction, in the backdrop of, of what has happened recently with the US, putting a lot of obstacles, what is your view on the US, the global regulatory landscape, and um, could the US be a game stopper for our industry? So I don't think the US is a game stopper, um, because I actually think Everyone already suspected it, but the U.S. has, or in this case, not the U.S. It's not correct to say it's the U.S. as a whole. I would say the SEC specifically has absolutely shown its hand. Which means that I think, in my view, the world now understands their position very clearly. Whether they win or not, because remember, these are allegations, is a question mark. But it means that the rest of the world has already discounted the U.S. activity. So to me, I feel like nobody's... You know, nobody in the world is building a business around the U.S. market. Nobody's thinking about, thinking about launching a token in the U.S. Nobody's even thinking about launching certain type of crypto-related projects there. It is unfortunately dead. But it also means we factored it in. And I think everyone already accepts that this won't change in six months. Everyone's thinking the earliest maybe after the election, right? So 18, 24 months. So it's all baked in. So, you know, whatever the prices are, we now understand the US is not a part of it. So to me, that's a good sign, because that means whatever downside we thought the US was going to give, it's already out there, right? It's like when FTX happened, when Three Arrows happened, you know, when Terra happened, when all these things happened, there was a shock, there was an adjustment, and then afterwards there was a, okay, life goes on. And this is, I think, the incredible strength of the resilience of our industry. The last 12 to 18 months, including macro events, like war and inflation, and yet the industry is still here and growing and excited. So to me, I think that's just a very strong sign. Now, the other thing to look at is we're based in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has been super crypto forward if you compare it to other places around the world. Uh, it's really interesting that not only have they approved retail trading for certain tokens, interesting enough, the same tokens that the SEC has alleged are securities, uh, China itself, has come out with a Web3 strategy paper the day after and on national TV. So this is the other thing, the national TV broadcast about Bitcoin and Hong Kong to all the citizens in China. Now to me, this is not a coincidence, right? It's something that is interesting about how that's being developed and what message China is trying to tell the world as well, not just in China, about what they want to do in the world of digital assets and Web3. Japan has made Web3 part of the national strategy of course, we know about UAE, and even Europe has come out with rules, you know, with, with MICA, for instance, around, around digital assets, which is you know, much more progressive than the US. My final thought on this is that it's not just about us as individuals. It's also about the nations themselves. One of the big reasons why we feel and we see, particularly in Asia, so many countries pushing Web3, is because they think of it as a way to reclaim part of their own digital sovereignty as a nation. All of our technology we use today, including in Europe, is US dependent. It's dependent on Apple, it's dependent on Facebook, it's dependent on Amazon, it's dependent on Google, right? Everything is US dependent. So Web3 could be that way in which you can build new technology platforms, new systems that at minimum are decentralized, so away from centralized power, but serve much more of a national interest of whatever country is involved than being dependent on you know, a third party that doesn't have your national interest at heart. So this is a big agenda item, and that's why so many countries outside of the U.S. are pushing Web3. Do you think from a competitive positioning point of view, it is realistic to build an industry without the U.S.? And will it stay that way, that the whole world will embrace Web3, but the U.S. will be like against it? So it's always, a, I think to me, it's always a mistake to count out the U.S. So I think the U.S. will come back to Web3 in a big way. So 
It's just not going to happen in maybe in the next 18 to 24 months. Because one, I don't think the US is going to be willingly giving up its monopolies in technology, so they're going to do that. People used to say that about AI, right? People used to say, you know, US is behind AI, China is going to control it, everything. And then look at the last six to 12 months, right? AI just took off and it's mostly a US narrative. So never count out the US. But it does mean that for the next two years, there is a benefit for companies outside of the US to build enough of an advantage in those local markets to build out an industry and to create more of a level playing field. And we've seen this in other industries. For instance, if you look at China as a market, China is a market that is independent of the US to an extent. It grew externally. It has its own factors around the world. It's not dependent on that. So again, I would say there are plenty of examples in the world where you can grow an industry without the US. Okay. So one thing that Animoca is famous for is GameFi and NFTs, but you guys are also very big in education. I'd love to touch upon this because this is something that connects Accenture's ex-schools with also with the spirit that you guys are representing. And I wonder, because it's a bit unusual, like Web3, but also education, I wonder what is behind it? Can you tell us, like, what is the intention that you are pushing for this? So there are two main strategies in general when we think about why we invest and how we grow the space. So everything has been pushing around things around digital property rights, right? We fundamentally believe that owning our digital property rights is the way in which we can ensure our digital freedom and have the benefit and ownership of all these network effects that accrue on these forms of digital property, which we currently don't own. So how do we do that? Well, this is where NFTs come in. So the strategy has been always around two main things, creating more network effects on NFTs, more utility, that's one, and two, expanding the market for NFT usage. So gaming was a good example because in gaming, you know, there's 3.4 billion people who play games, most gamers at least think they should own their assets, so it seemed like an easy tag along. So that was why we focused on gaming so heavily four or five years ago, and we continue to do so. We have some great projects, actually many of them in France, like you know, the team at Life Beyond or Sandbox, for instance, right? All of those are building really cool products here in this part of the world. But then we also look at expanding that reach further, and that's where education came in. Because gaming is a $200 billion industry today, but education is a $5 trillion industry today. And what's also interesting is that education touches all of us. Every day, we are learning something. Whether you're children, whether you're adults, you never stop learning. And so it's something that's really important. Also, we felt that for adoption, what we found in gaming, we had to actually educate people about Web3. Just opening a wallet wasn't enough. You had to train them about financial literacy. You had to make them understand you know, why you should own something. That's something that a lot of people have forgotten the purpose on. So education becomes critical as well. You can't just give you a wallet. You have to explain it to them. So we acquired a company in Israel called TinyTap. And TinyTap basically is a uh, teacher marketplace. And what the teachers were able to do there is they were able to create content on this platform. And they make like $50, $100, maybe $1,000 a year on additional content, how to learn math or how to learn something like this. Nice side income. We turned these teacher contents into NFTs. Now, what became special? It made it possible that every piece of content became an asset, which makes it a platform. It made it possible that someone could now own that asset for marketing, for yield, for capital formation. Now, we do this with real estate. I buy a house, maybe it makes $100,000 a year, therefore I think it's worth $2 million, for instance, or maybe $1 million, whatever yield you're interested in. But you can only do this for items that are worth a lot of money. Because you have to hire a lawyer, you have to sort of do a, get a notary, you have to do conveyancing. The process of buying an asset in which you can have contract ownership has to mean, meet a minimum revenue standard, which means anything that makes less than that cannot enjoy the benefits of capital formation. And this is one of the most, I would say, one of the superpowers of crypto, because you can create uh, capital formation on things that are only one or two or three dollars. So this teacher who now makes a hundred dollars a year on this. NFT on this asset that maybe teaches some kid around the world math can now sell it to someone else for $1,000 because the person is happy to take a 10% yield on it. So you create capital formation. Now you go to places like Venezuela where a teacher on average makes $16 a month and he might only make $10 or $20 on this type of content a year. He can now sell that for $100. That is life-changing money for them and basically capitalizes an intellectual property that could never be capitalized before. In the same way that crypto has also created banking opportunities 
for all the people who don't have access to a bank account. So it's actually the same narrative. It just set, elevates at one level. Because when you transfer one NFT for less than a dollar, you don't only own the intellectual property, you own the rights, you own where the money goes, you, own, you basically take the entire legal transaction through the transfer of a single, single uh, transaction. So what that means to us is, is that teachers, like K-12 education, is a $200 billion industry in itself. Everything that a teacher makes can now become a capital asset. It can become intellectual property. So we foresee a future where educators and teachers could basically be treated like musicians or artists, where their work can also generate income and royalty. And to us, that's fundamental as well, not only because it can teach the world about crypto, because they obviously will earn through crypto, but also teachers deserve to make more money. They actually are spending more time with our children than probably most parents do, right? But, uh, so it's a very critical role in society, but they don't get rewarded for it in the same way. As a result, by not getting paid enough, the best people who could teach don't join teaching, right? It's a typical sort of flywheel. We still live in a capitalist uh, um, society today. And so that, we think, will, will change the result. The first NFTs we sold, some of them were teachers in America. They made over a year or a year and a half for the salary. They started hiring their friends. They started building a business. They started becoming entrepreneurs, which was wonderful to see. It's very interesting to listen to you because it feels like your strategy is informed uh, by a deep purpose and intention, much more than just a short-term view, taking a really long-term view. Because as you know, education is highly regulated. Teachers don't like to change so quickly, as we discussed yesterday. Um, nevertheless, you deeply believe in it, and you are highly invested in, in it. I mean, I would also add that the journey of whether it's gaming or whether it's uh, education has to do a little bit with your own personal journey. Mm -hmm. like, meaning, just because we do education doesn't mean others should be doing education. It has to speak to you. In the last 20 years or so, I've done over 25 personal edtech investments. Most of them have failed. But I feel like those last failed investments in education have taught me about the industry. Right? It's taught me what is possible, what isn't possible, and why I should be maybe in this space. But also, it's a learning. Right? And so, again, all these history, even with gaming, if I wasn't doing gaming back in the 80s, I wouldn't actually have an appreciation, perhaps, as to what is happening today. So it feels to me like the main reason, or one of the main reasons why you are a trusted leader in the industry, and everyone I know loves to work with Animoca, you guys are amazing, is one of the main reasons is because it's purpose-driven. Purpose if we could put you in a time capsule and send you back to the beginnings of Animoca, what are the things you would do differently and what are the things you would keep? So I, my general philosophy on things is that even the mistakes that we made are the paths that bring us to where we are today. In other words, I don't really have a lens of saying, oh, I wish I didn't do that. I mean, there's many things we wish we didn't do. Like, I wish I bought Bitcoin in 2014 or something. Sure, right? <laughs> but, I mean, but if I did, I think my life would be different. I think if I suddenly was sitting with a lot of Bitcoin, for instance, I might be looking at the world differently. Maybe I won't be building what I'm building. Maybe I would, I don't know, doing something else. Maybe I would become very financial. I don't know. Right? So I think all of the journeys that we go through push us into an area including, the, in fact, in particular, the failures and the mistakes actually shape us more deeply than the successes. So I don't know that I would change anything, but I would say a few things around lessons, maybe, in terms of what we experienced, what we maybe should have considered differently. And I think it relates a little bit to human nature. So when we're trying to, you know, we were one of the first companies to always talk about a multi-chain future. For those who remember in 2018 and 2019, everyone was building Ethereum killers. It was all about the Ethereum killer. But we were like, that doesn't make sense. We should build multi-chain. But the principle why we thought we should build multi-chain was because as content creators, we felt that the only way for a content creator to be really free, to be independent, and to have choice is to have many choices, which means you have to have many chains. And we look at chains almost like nations. Whereas the chain builders were looking at monopoly. They were looking at control. They were saying, bring as much traffic into it so that I become the number one chain, and then I dominate, and then I can tax you, which is actually a Web2 strategy. So the thinking around is to identify more clearly who's building really Web3 has to be someone who believes in a shared network effect, mm -hmm. who believes how the world can look better. In the same way that people who are building an open source, they're those who take advantage of open source, mm -hmm. but they're those who really believe in open source. 
It's a big difference. It's a slight nuance. Right? I can be a great builder on open source, but do I actually contribute my code back? Do I actually give to the community? Or am I just a net taker, for instance? Right? So, so those are some of the things that you know, maybe we should identify more clearly uh, and also ex sort of explain that thinking. There's, a, there's, a, there's some good examples as to, you know, for instance, GameFi. GameFi had a moment with Axie Infinity. That moment uh, will come back in a big way, we believe, because all the good games will come out. But Axie Infinity could have become so much bigger if the Ronin chain was open. Because what ultimately happened was that Ronin wasn't ready to be open, and so all the network effects were contained only within Axie the game. But what should have happened is that if the network effect was wide open, other game companies, other developers would have started building new products on top of the ownership of Axies, and that would grow as big as it did. Now, we would tell many companies, this includes with Flow and Dapper Labs and everything, the similar story about build open and build, you know, and they all say they will do it, but they didn't do it quickly enough, and the result was that they lost the benefits of the network effect. But the loser isn't only the company that didn't make that quick decision, it's the entire industry. Because when Axie Infinity would grow the way that it did, and if thousands of companies, not just guilds, would build new games and products on top of the ownership of these axes, we would have a much bigger GameFi industry today, and we would be building a lot more stuff, and we would be more forward to the future as we are right now. And so this comes down to the thing about human nature, that you believe in this, but then when there's this moment when all this money comes to you, at that moment, you need to have quite a bit of uh, restraint to be able to say, you know what? we're going to still build our mission instead of trying to take as much as we can. Right? And that, I think, has to do with education. Building that okay. mission is so important, <laughs> guys. That conversation was absolutely spectacular. Unfortunately, we're out of time for those of you who are watching at home right now. But my god, this was such an incredible conversation uh, to be continued. Please, a big round of applause for Yatsu from Anamoka Brands, Sohair. Co-founder and CEO of X Ventures. <laughs> I, I guess we just